On Friday, January 12th, Canada and the rest of the world was taken by storm as the story of a young 11-year-old Muslim girl who was attacked twice while on her way to school by an Asian man. Kala Noman's hijab was cut, she fled, he came back. In no time, the young girl found herself in front of multiple news cameras explaining her story. The backlash was incredible. Many Canadian politicians jumped on the chance to disavow this brutal, intolerant, un-Canadian attack and rally with the poor victim. The national outrage did not wait for the investigation or evidence of the attack before going public. Throughout the weekend, Twitter exploded with people divided amongst two lines. On one side, the people showed their support for the young girl and decried Islamophobia and racism in Canada. On the other, a group of healthy skeptics who were questioning details of the official story. This led to a showdown between the two sides as they fought it out to know the truth. By Monday, January 15th, it was revealed that the, by the Toronto police that the story was a hoax. The attack had never taken place, no hijab had been cut, no one had committed the crime. The girl had lied and the Canadian media and political spheres bought it, hook, line and sinker. Those that were quick to condemn Canadian society were forced to roll back their previous statements of support, do a complete 180 and disavow the lies. Still, many politicians and journalists tried to use this fake story to continue pushing the narrative of Islamophobia, as Kathleen Wynne said it was still important to denounce hate crimes, and Huffington Post stated that it was the Canadian people who owed the, gir the young girl an apology, not the other way around. Other media outlets wondered how did the story go viral, ironically and conveniently forgetting that their rush to push the story the mass tweeting by Canadian politician and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's public statement were the reasons for the story going global. These same publications also retracted the use of the girl's name in the publications and began blurring her face after the story was proven to be a hoax. The reporting on why the hoax took place had been non-existent as if we were all supposed to just forget about it. Most of the politicians that came out to condemn the attack would only say they were relieved that the attack didn't take place. Yet there was no condemnation for the fake story. Canadians all over the country were outraged. Being labeled as racist, the Canadian people were demanding an apology from officials that did not come. Justin Trudeau, the apology prime minister, could not work up the courage to apologize to the Canadian people for his slanderous words and take responsibility as being one of the few who were responsible for releasing the girl's name publicly. My heart goes out to the uh, young girl who was uh, attacked uh, seemingly for her religion. He too, like the rest, claim only that he was relieved the attack didn't take place. This cookie-cutting remarks from the media and politicians, to me, looks fabricated. Why would all have the exact same reaction to the news of the hoax? Why were none even outraged that they had been lied to? I found myself on the skeptical side from the beginning. To me, what didn't make sense was the fact that the girl was attacked, then she met up with a group of students from her school gets separated again just a few minutes later from both her brother and the, the student group, leaving her vulnerable to once again be attacked. In my experience, even when siblings don't get along, they will selflessly defend their brother or sister to the end. Family is tight even when they don't get along. I have no reason to believe that Kala Noman or her brother have a bad relationship, so I believe that after the original attack, her brother would not leave her side for the rest of the day. So the fact that they got separated so easily after the original attack didn't add up. Also, what kind of society allows a young girl to be attacked in the streets in broad daylight and no one does anything? That is not Canada. The hoax was said to be uh, perpetrated at 9am, at the height of rush hour as people are going to work. People would be all around, 
Toronto has a high population and in many ways can look like New York during the daytime, with endless bustling of activity, yet no one saw anything, no one intervened. Despite the fact that the story was proven to be a hoax, there are still many questions that need to be answered, and they're not even being asked. When using the official attack time of 9am, how could the CBC hear of the story, drive to the location, interview the victim, push the story through the regular editing channels, and report the story, all within 42 minutes from the alleged attack? Upon further investigation, nothing about the original timeline that was reported makes sense. But this is not concerning Kala Noman's story, but on the reporting of the media and the tweets put out by the politicians. Let me explain. Let's go back and follow through the story bit by bit. When the attack was reported, the skeptical ones on Twitter did their own investigation. One man, going by the Twitter handle Manny Onoa, did some great work at debunking the narrative. As we can see, upon inputting into Google Maps the distance from the CBC news station in Toronto to the location of uh, to the location of the school, it took more than 35 minutes to reach the destination, leaving less than 10 minutes to speak with the girl and report the story. Some have responded by saying that this can be avoided with a telephone interview with the school, but there were cameras and microphones from the CBC, CTV, and Global News that were present on the scene. The article written in 9.42 a.m. contains a picture of the young girl at the press conference, which means that they were present, once again leading to the question, how did they show up and report the story so quickly? On top of this, it has been revealed that the mother was the one who requested to speak to the press. She would have either had to travel to the school and, ta and then make the request, which would have taken away even more time from the CBC with its 42 minute time from attack to story being released. Or she would have had to make the request when she got the phone call from the school letting her know what had happened, which is suspicious that she would make this decision before even seeing her daughter after being attacked. If the timeline is not enough to convince you that there is still more behind the hoax than a fake story, then perhaps you will consider this. After the story was released, many politicians disowned it. Politicians were jumping on it like wildfire, especially the liberal MPs. Every single one mimicked the other in their words. They condemned the attack that Islamophobia and racism are still big problems in Canada and, needed, and need to be addressed. This is quite obviously pushing the political agenda especially because the Liberals are the ones consistently talking about how terrible Canadian society is, how racist, misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, and every other type of phobia. Yet lately, this has been getting debunked as more and more cases of hate crimes are proven false. Kathleen Wynne was one of the first people to tweet her support. If we look at this picture from the press conference on the day of the fake attack, we see this woman in the red hijab standing next to Kala Noman. This woman is Shamiza Beg. In 2016, Kathleen Wynne went to meet with the Islamic Circle of North America, based in Scarborough. Wynne tweeted out this picture on August 26, 2016. I call your attention to the far right of the frame, to the woman in the black hijab. A striking resemblance. Shamiza Beg sits as a non-teaching member of the Gateway Public School School Advisory Council, which is a group parent volunteers who work in collaboration with school administrators, staff, and the Toronto District School Board. She is also listed as an executive committee member at Don Valley West Provincial Liberal Association. Don Valley West is a political riding in Toronto. More specifically, it is Kathleen Wynne's writing, the one she has retained since 2003. And let us not forget that Kathleen Wynne began her career in public office as a Toronto District School Board trustee in the year 2000, the same school board that has authority over Kaula Noman's school, Pauline Johnson Jr. Public School. So that brings us full circle. 
Also, after the hoax was revealed and Kalanoma's face was blurred by the press, Shamiza Beg's face was also blurred. Yet, Kaula's brother and her mother remained unblurred. First of all, why is Shamiza Beg being blurred when she had nothing to do with the situation? Second, why is she even there? She does not sit on the school board for Pauline Johnson Jr. Public School, and even if she did, her job is getting parents more involved with the school board, have more knowledge of the school board. It has nothing to do with hate crimes or public relations. Shamiza Beg has been in the news before. In 2011, Shamiza was part of a controversy at Valley Park Middle School. After a number of Muslim students started leaving in the middle of the day to attend prayer and then were, ne were not coming back, the school tried something different. Shamiza was the orchestrator of allowing Muslim children to pray in public schools, showing a preference of one religion over another, which is banned in Canada, and also because this led to the segregation of young girls and boys during prayer time. On top of this, the prayer session used to humiliate the young girls who were menstruating by not allowing them to pray. Many parents were rightfully upset and put a stop to it before the situation got out of control. If we look back at the photo of Kathleen Wynne with the Islamic Circle of North America, while it is much more difficult to tell due to the niqab, several people have theorized that one of the veiled women with the red arrows is perhaps Sema Samad, Kaula Noman's mother. If one of these women are Sema, then I think it is the one in the back with the zebra print niqab. Sema Samad had a similar type of niqab at the time of the press conference. However, right now it remains unclear if any of those women were Sema Samad. Maybe it's coincidence, but Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was scheduled to arrive in Scarborough on January 15th, close to the same location as to where the attack allegedly took place. According to his itinerary, he was scheduled to attend the Thai Pongal Festival. This next part is just my stupid opinion. There are a few different possibilities as to what happened in this situation. While we know that the child lied, I don't believe we can leave it at that. Too many things don't add up for this to just be a simple act of a child lying. Probably the most popular theory going around right now is the theory of Takiya. Takiya is when a Muslim is allowed to lie without religious repercussions in order to further the cause of Islam. This is possible, and I do think it plays a part in what took place, but it still doesn't explain the anomalies. One theory, I wish it was true, but however I highly doubt it is, came from Ali Rizvi, a well-known atheist. While discussing it with his mother, his mother had this to say. The incident could have been the creation of this little girl's mind, but why did she make it up? Because she didn't want to be isolated. She wanted to be like other girls. She wanted to make friends. She didn't want to have to be ridiculed. In short, she didn't want to be different. She didn't want the scarf. She probably thought that by seeing her hijab as a security risk, her parents wouldn't force her to wear it. I wonder if these parents are really helping their children get a better future or are ruining their future by supporting their mistakes and teaching them how to tell a lie. For me, this act of parents is reflective of hate because they are corrupting the innocent minds of their children in the name of religion by imposing values that they, them, they themselves couldn't stand and for which they left their own country. That was the theory by Ali Rizvi's mother. While I wish this was the case, that it was simply the girl trying to send out a message it still does not explain the anomalies. What I think really happened is this. I do believe that there was an overt cover-up of the situation, both before and after the hoax was revealed. I find the connection Kathleen Wynne has to the situation is too close, and in fact, she has a bigger hand in this than Justin Trudeau, if Justin Trudeau had any hand in it. She has personal and professional attachments to Shamiza, who was present during the interview. She very recently made a statement about racism and Islamophobia being on the rise in Canada. 
yet the facts have not supported this claim. Kathleen Wynne has a 17% approval rating and is just months away from an election that she is scheduled to lose badly. Many don't trust her and have seen through her facade. She has made her career on peddling the progressive narratives of racism, sexism, etc., etc. If this is a political hoax, and I find it hard to believe that it, it isn't, then it seems to me that Wynne's fingerprints are all over this crime scene. Along with the connection to Shamiza, she too has connection to the school board who did not handle the situation well, putting what they believe to be a victim, but still their student, up front in the spotlight almost immediately. Although this decision does also fall on the parents, so the board is not alone in mishandling the situation. What happened to the hijab? Why was it not presented as evidence during the press conference? The media, on the other hand, they were in on it. I do not see how they couldn't be. The timeline was the most damaging part in my opinion. As I looked through all the possibilities, I, can, I can't think of how this happened. CTV full out deleted their article on the hijab attack and only advertise it as a hoax now, as if it never happened. After the hoax was exposed, several outlets doubled down on their narrative of rising Islamophobia and defending how the hoax happened as simply due to media competition. None have pursued the story further, yet many people would have after be having the wool pulled over their eyes and having been made a fool of. Finally, it was after the story was determined to be a hoax that they began retracting her name and blurring her photo. No consideration for these details before, but now it is important to protect an identity that they made public to the international community. Even if the media was not aware of a deliberate hoax, then they tried to use it for massive ratings and credibility. Their mistake? Pulling this move so soon to Trump's fake news awards, and as such has had the reverse effect and caused even more distrust between the Canadian people and the news. As for the theory that Twitter was attempting to throttle this story, I do think it happened due to recent revelations from Project Veritas, but this was independent of the story and was Twitter doing what Twitter does, censor information they don't like. So in conclusion, I find myself leaning to the belief that this was orchestrated by Wynne's government as an attempt to rally su support around her in the upcoming election. The Liberal Party of Ontario has been in charge of the province for, for most of the 2000s, and this is the first time they are threatened to lose. Nothing has worked for Win lately. Accusing her opponents of sexism or homophobia is no longer working. After that, she sued her political opponent Patrick Brown because he said that she had broken the law in the gas plant scandal, and she claimed that this was slander, yet this was not gained support for her and only given more to Patrick Brown. Now, on top of everything we've heard so far about Kathleen Wynne, it was just announced today, January 24th, that her political opponent, Patrick Brown, is being accused by two women of sexual assault when they were teenagers. This is a charge that Patrick Brown vehemently and tearfully defended against, saying that they are false and lies. Next was to move to the fact that hatred is on the rise in Canada, which she has talked about many times, yet there is nothing to support this fact. This, the hate crime statistics do not support this rise of Islamophobia. Also, the Jews, the black community, and the LGBT community almost every year receive more hate crimes committed against them than against the Muslim community, a fact people are starting to realize. Only in 2015 did the Muslim community move up to number two in the hate crime statistics. But I actually believe that this had more to do with the friction that came from the migrant crisis. Since then, these numbers have continually dropped. The next step, a hoax that would garner international headlines and prove her point and show others why only wind leadership and policies can create the equal society needed to end these hate crimes. All of Wynne's policies are about equality. 
if people realize her policies are unnecessary or ineffective, then there's no need for the current liberal government. This is why Trudeau and the rest of the liberal politicians talk so much about the terribly bigoted country called Canada. They need this to be true, to validate their existence. The Liberal Party always needs a victim. The reason they talk of Islamophobia so much is because the Muslims are a large minority group in Canada. There are nearly as many Muslims in Canada as there are indigenous people, and they all vote liberal. Along with Trudeau's massive immigration policy, they are grooming votes from the Muslim community. They present the bigotry and hatred as coming from the right wing, therefore they should not vote for them, when in fact it is the liberals that are using this narrative to keep the Muslims under their voting control. This hoax is a political motivation mixed in with taqiyya. Lying to further the cause of Islam will always benefit the policies that the Trudeau government are looking to push. The Trudeau and Wynn liberals have always been about control. They befriend the Muslim community to garner its support, keeping them controlled this way, while further pushing the idea of racism to keep the population guilty and voting for them. They gain the minority vote by saying that they are standing up for them, and they gain the white vote by making them believe that they are terrible people who can only redeem themselves by actively seeking forgiveness. Original sin, essentially. Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about coddling is something that you do to your enemies to make them weak. This can also be used for control. The liberal government has coddled their constituents, creating a weakness where the people believe they are either the problem or that the problems are too large and that the government must be the ones to fix them. This theory that there is political involvement, it may seem far-fetched for some, even after listening to the evidence I have presented. While this is only the conclusion that I have drawn, I have a hard time, considering everything, seeing how it was just a lie that, f that we all fell for. I can only see manipulation coming from this story. While it is true that we should not use this as a standard to judge future crimes of a similar nature, what is also true is that many of these high-profile hate crimes cases turn out to be a hoax, perpetrated by someone looking to garner sympathy from the masses. We should use this situation, this story, not as a standard, but as a lesson. The media and many Canadians accepted this story without question jumping on the bandwagon without waiting for more evidence. We should learn to question the official stories and never accept something as fact just because it is presented as such, especially when it is considerate, considered news. Some time ago, I remember hearing a stat that one in five news stories are false. Even if this number is not completely accurate, we can see that fake news stories are on the rise. These may be lies of omission, blatant inaccuracies, misrepresenting the other side, or misrepresenting the facts, and it has become all too commonplace. Propaganda is everywhere, even in the West. Don't fall for it. Question everything. Don't trust anything the government tells you unless you can prove it. May these be the lessons we gain from this hijab hoax. And may we never be led into falsehood so blatantly again. You're